I want to try and uh, build on what uh, Wendy was saying uh, and on what Martin was saying yesterday and try and get kind of down into some of the detail of what it is, if I can be so bold, that I think you should be talking about in your partnerships and a little bit about of advice perhaps from may, uh, about sort of 17 or 18 years of experience of working with schools who are developing very much the kinds of approaches that Wendy uh, was talking about. I mean, in a way, the future is already here. We're talking about 21st century education. The future is already here, but as someone famous once said, it's just unevenly distributed at the moment. And I think there's quite a lot of joining up that has already happened here in South Australia uh, and a bit more that could go on. Um, I subscribe to the Michael Fullan view of school leadership, which basically says that leadership is about 60 or 70 percent being absolutely clear and committed as to where your school is going, and the rest of it is about how to get there. And half of that how to get there is what do we need to do differently? And the other half of the how to get there is and how are we going to help our staff and our schools and our preschools learn to do the things that are a little bit different? Uh, as I say, the kinds of things very much that uh, uh, Wendy was just talking about. So the first bit, I want to kind of go through those three bits. First of all, the kind of where we might be heading and how what's, uh, what's going on in here in South Australia fits with what's going on in the rest of the world. And then look a little bit more at some of the practical, nitty gritty, small but significant changes that many schools around the planet are already making um, and many schools around South Australia uh, as well. So let me start with uh, absolutely back to basics. I don't think we can make any progress really with what the partnerships are doing, with what they're for, with what leadership is about until we're really clear about where we want to go. And I'll, I'll come back and say a little bit more about that. So this is, uh, this is my argument, if you like. And as I go through it very quickly, just I've asked audiences before to try and see if they can spot the flaw in my argument, because I want to know whether it's watertight or not. So basically, education is what we lay on for young people to prepare them for the future. So whether it's successful or not depends on whether we accurately imagine what that future is going to be. It also depends on being really clear that all young people have the deep entitlement to, as it were, win in education. So it's a preparation for life, not just for university or for work, and it's a preparation for all, not just for some. We know from the, from the learning sciences now that the sort of assumption that was around certainly when I was at school, which was that schools more or less were the way they meant to be, and it was just unfortunate that roughly half of them in the UK weren't given enough brain power to fully benefit from what there was. And we now know that that's scientifically discredited, that view, and educationally dysfunctional. Uh, and therefore, it, that creates a responsibility for us to be thinking not just about how to get the best grades out of students and how to squeeze a few more students to get better grades than they might otherwise would, but to keep remembering that the grades game is a competitive game and the grades, the top grades, only have value because some children didn't get them and therefore there has to be another way of winning in the educational system so that when Ruby leaves school with a very low set of qualifications and grades, as some students always will, she is able to say honestly and gratefully, thank you for a great education because it wasn't just about the grades. There was something else that it was about. Um, and we have to face that question seriously, or honestly, I don't think we can consider ourselves to be a 21st century school yet. We haven't moved into that uh, world of understanding. <clears throat> Second part of the argument, obviously, and these are cliches, aren't they? The future is complex, challenging, uncertain, 
your iPad will be an antique in three years' time. We, don't, we have no idea what's, what's coming along, what's coming down the track. Therefore, here comes the conclusion, at, the, at its heart, at its core, 21st century education has to be about preparing young people to be able to think on their feet, to deal well with uncertainty, to bring intelligence to the unknown. And that needs to sit at the heart of everything that we're doing in schools. Here is a, this idea has been around for a long time. This quote, which I've put in Old English script, uh, because it refers to the contrast between the old and the new views, if you like. The skills you can learn when you're at school, many of them will be obsolete by the time you get into the workforce, except one, the skill of making the right response to situations for which you have not been specifically prepared. And that's a challenge, isn't it? Because part of what we've been used to doing is getting students ready, pre-preparing them for particular performances. And this is different, or at least it's complementary. And as we're doing that, as we're trying to figure out what that means for us in schools, the way we design activities, the way we write reports, the way we talk to students, the way we communicate with their parents, all of those different kinds of aspects, as we're doing all that, we also have to make sure that the grades are going up as well. Now, this is, therefore, this poses the choice that we're faced with in a slightly different way from the way it is sometimes posed. I think this is the right way of thinking about the choice that all of us as school leaders, people who care about doing the best for young people, this is the right way of thinking about what that choice is. It's two ways of getting good results, but one of them prepares young people powerfully to be able to cope well with novelty and uncertainty, and the other doesn't. So the choice is this. We can get good results in a way that produces young people who are passive, dependent, and anxious about failure, or, and this is obviously over-polarized, or we can get good results and produce young people who are inquisitive, imaginative, and independent in their approach to learning. And that's the choice we're faced with. We don't have to look at the choice as either its grades and standards and driving up performance and increasing the results on NAPLAN and those kinds of indicators, or we're going to do some fluffy, nebulous, ill-conceived, newfangled stuff about preparing young people for an uncertain world. No, that's not the choice we have to make. The choice is, how do we do both? And can we do both? So we need to be sensitive to the data. And the data is on my side. The data says we can do both. And therefore, we could if we want to. We don't have to choose between standards and the development of, and lots of different phrases indicate how people around the world are struggling with this issue because it's a difficult problem. It may even be, as Dawn O'Neill was saying yesterday, a wicked problem, I think it is. But that doesn't mean we should retreat from it into more certain and more old-fashioned kind of preoccupations. This is just some of our own data, which shows that the more you invest in helping your students in preschool or primary school, become more resourceful and resilient in the face of difficulty, the better your test scores are. Our test scores are uh, at age 11, they're called Key Stage 2 SATs in the UK, but the top graph shows that over the years when a school is embarking on this kind of approach or strengthening the practice in this kind of way, those test scores go up very, um, reassuringly, uh, and they don't go down. The bottom graph here shows the same, very similar data for secondary schools divided into individual secondary schools, and you can see that you get a similar kind of effect. You get, there's one school in the middle which is plateauing because this is the real world, and nothing is a magic bullet, 
but by and large you can see uh, encouraging improvements. This is what we call GCSE point scores, national exams in the UK when the students are about 16 years old, both for high achieving schools and for low achieving schools. Everybody benefits from this. In fact, recent data that we have shows that low achieving students benefit disproportionately more than high achieving students when their teachers are making explicit reference, are constantly talking about what it means to be a powerful and effective learner and how to become better at it. That narrows the gap between the lower achieving students and the higher achieving students. But high achieving students also benefit from this. This is some data that I was sent uh, a little while ago from a school in Scotland called Gordonston, uh, which is a, a fee-paying school, but not a hugely high achieving school. They do an awful lot of outdoor education, which is good. And this just shows their A-level results, which is what our youngsters in the UK take when they're 18 years old, over the last few years. And you see quite a rapid jump in 2011 and 2012 as they started paying more attention to building the capacity of their students to be more independent. So if you look at a preschool that's been following this kind of track for a while, uh, you will find places where youngsters, young children, three and four year olds are happily organizing and managing their learning for themselves, getting on with what they're interested in doing with just the occasional nudge from an adult, occasional subtle important nudge from an adult, but perfectly capable of trying to resolve difficulties for themselves, either individually or collectively, and to manage and choose and evaluate learning for themselves. Fast forward from there to an upper secondary, year 11 or year 12 class. A friend of mine is the principal of a school in, in uh, England, a high achieving secondary school, and he now teaches his A-level physics groups by spending half a day with them every half term, going through in detail what the syllabus looks like for that half term, what the tricky bits are going to be, what they could perfectly well learn on their own by looking at online material, by logging on to a Stanford University MOOC lecture or something like that, what they could, they think they could perfectly well work out for themselves and when and how often and for what purposes they might need to meet together for a clinic with their teacher. And then they go off and do it. And they're getting better results than they ever did before in that school. So this is perfectly possible with children of a whole variety of different ages and a whole variety of different abilities. And that's good news. It's good news for us. And John Hattie is also on my side. John Hattie is a bit like the Bible, isn't he? You can get what you want out of John Hattie. You can pick the, pick the bits that, uh, that you find encouraging. This is my encouraging bit. The biggest effect sizes on students' levels of achievement, he said in the, the first book, the Visible Learning book, occur, I'm going to leave out the middle bit for the moment and come back to it, occur when pupils become their own teachers. Even if we're only interested in test scores, it's smart to think about how we could more systematically, progressively, teach them in a way that transfers understanding, sophistication, and the ability to manage and organize learning for themselves. That turns out to be a very smart way of boosting your test scores. And it's self-evidently a smart way of preparing youngsters better for the complexities and rigors of the real world. So this stuff, is some people think, I've come across different attitudes to this, some people think, oh, this is only for the bright or the high achieving because it's too complex or too demanding for the low achievers. No, it isn't. Some people think, oh, it's sort of remedial life skills for the low achievers and they'll be fine because they're getting high grades. No, it isn't. Uh, and let me say a little bit more about each of those. Some of you might have read recently um, 
a very good distillation of research about the impact on children from poor or low achieving backgrounds of investing explicitly in developing their resilience and their resourcefulness as learners. The book is by an American writer called Paul Tuff. The book is called How Children Succeed. And it's a very good and very credible distillation of research in this area. And one of his main arguments is summarized in this quotation. Put very broadly, these are very broad generalizations. Kids from, let's not talk in wealth terms, let's talk in so kind of social background terms that Dawn was talking about yesterday. Kids from, from homes that are stable and well configured and where there are a number of adults around who've had successful experiences of going through school have a powerfully supportive social network which enables them, which helps them trim and adjust and monitor how they're going and help them to correct their journeys. But some children are not lucky enough to have that. And therefore, it is all the more important that those abilities to be resilient, to be self-managing, to be self-organizing, which are distributed around this network for luckier children, it's all the more important that we try and figure out powerful and systematic ways of helping the less fortunate children internalize those abilities for themselves. Because that is what will give them one of the most powerful boosts in life. Paul Tufts, the quote here is, if you don't have a social safety net, you need to compensate in another way. To succeed, you need more grit, more social intelligence, more self-control, than wealthier kids or kids who are, come from better backgrounds. But it's not just the low achieving children. Take Emily. She's a bright young woman. And she said in a survey recently, I, she said, I know I'm bright and that I'm going to get good grades, but I worry that I've become a tape recorder. I worry that once I'm out of school and people stop handing me information with questions, I'll be lost. That's quite a good description of old-fashioned education, isn't it? We hand students information with questions. We've neatened it up, we've packaged it, we've taken a lot of the jungliness, the uncertainty, the complexity out of that information, and we hand them, at an appropriate rate, packets of information with questions. It's well-organized, well-managed, it's an effective way of creating an education that is examinable but Emily says, I'm worried that that comes with a cost. It comes with the cost that I won't have learnt how to engage with things that are more complex, more tricky, more wicked than the things that I met at school. And she's right to think that. Just have a quick chat around your tables. It just impairs. Take one of these questions and ask your neighbor to talk for a minute. Uh, about that question. Just have a quick go at that. Okay, great, thank you very much. So, these questions are the kinds of questions that will be fired at you out of the blue if you go for an interview to Cambridge. They won't ask you to, to produce your well-rehearsed bodies of knowledge. 
they'll fire tricky questions at you, and these questions come from a little booklet that actually circulates underground amongst Cambridge University admissions tutors. It's a booklet of questions, but some of these were outed in a British newspaper the other day, so they've got to think up more tricky questions, which of course they're perfectly capable of doing because they're Cambridge Doms, and Cambridge Doms can think up tricky questions. Why will they fire these questions at you? Because they want to find out whether you can think on your feet. And a lot of bright, high-achieving, successful youngsters don't know how to. They flounder when they're confronted with this experience. So the grades are not enough. If I talk in my language and say, there are two candidates, both of whom have got four A's in their A-levels. One of them can start to think intelligently about whether wasps are intelligent or why manhole cover covers around. They're able to stay present with something that is surprising and unexpected. And that student will get into Cambridge and the other one won't. The one who is, as it were, too tied to the predetermined, well-rehearsed performances will not get into the best universities these days. They won't get into Harvard. They may not get into the top universities in Australia. Some teachers, it's back to my choice, isn't it? Some teachers will have helped their students be able to get the grades in a way like Emily that has not systematically developed their ability to think on their feet. In fact, may systematically have undermined their ability to think on their feet because they've learnt that learning is about creating well-rehearsed performances. But others won't. They'll have been taught differently. And they'll both have got good grades, but one will be readier for the 21st century and certainly for three years at Cambridge or Harvard or wherever than others. This is, again, something I was reading in the Guardian Online, a British newspaper, the other day. These are two of the questions that you might are likely to be asked if you want to get a job with Google. And there are right and wrong answers to these questions. Again, they will have changed them now, so don't think you can rehearse your answer or get your students to rehearse their answers to these questions. If you're asked, do you have an IQ greater than 130, the correct answer is, I haven't a clue. If you have and know you have and are proud of having, you're not the kind of person they want at Google because you will be attached to an image of intelligence which is not the kind of intelligence that they want. If they ask you whether you have a proven track record of success, be careful what you say. Because if you say yes and proudly show off your track record of success, they will quickly become suspicious that you will want to bring to your work in Google a set of predetermined pre ideas about what is successful, which will blind you to the new, the novel, and the complex. It's a different world out there. And it's a different world, therefore, that we're preparing young people for. So how do we help them get the best possible grades and do it in a way that builds these transferable, flexible qualities of mind so they won't be anxious and angry when they're turned down from their Oxbridge interview uh, and they'll be ready to be an employee of Google, which is a great job to have because they give you free beer and pizza on Fridays. So the moral of the story is results are not enough. Results are important, but they're not enough. We have to add something else. What we're aiming for and what I would love your partnerships to be struggling with, those of you, many of you are already doing this, I know, because I've talked to some of you and been into a few of your schools, but for all of you, I think the where we're heading, what the point of these partnerships is, is to be struggling with what's the plus and how are we going to deliver it. That that's the entitlement for youngsters in the 21st century. You could put it this way. The old-fashioned school 
defined success, the success of the school and the success of its students, in a way that I think of is rather like a sort of small screen, old fashioned television. Certainly in, in England, it was the kinds of things, if you look at a secondary school, it tended to be the things that were written on the screen were admissions to high status universities, performance in state or federal examinations, one or two other things, and then down the bottom there were little compartments for the performance of the first 15 and the school orchestra and the school play. That was how schools defined success, and you knew that was how they defined success because that was what they crowed about on the home pages of their websites, and that was what was displayed in the trophy case in the foyer of the school. And that was pretty much it in, in caricature. There were other bits and pieces that went, went along with that. But now, to put it in the way that I'm talking about it, now schools have a much bigger smart screen television. They've got that stuff on it. Obviously, it is still about results. It's not either or. We're not going to fall into that trap. But now there are other things. A school won't be happy unless it is very clear about what the qualities are that it is striving to develop in its youngsters. It won't be happy unless it's been successful in producing those qualities and knows it. And knows it. So what that means is that an awful lot of schools, maybe some of your partnerships will want to be talking about this, an awful lot of schools are now tracking their students through from their preschool to their primary school, from their primary school to their secondary school, from their secondary school to their college or their university, because they want to know, they want to be absolutely sure, they want to get good data as to whether their youngsters have been helped to become as independent, as resilient, as resourceful, as inquisitive, as imaginative, as collaborative, as they now find they need to be. A thought about different kinds of data that we might be interested in recovering uh, in order to be able to be clearer about what the direction of travel is that we want our partnerships to proceed in. Well, let's talk a little bit about what the plus is. And the words have been used. Martin was talking uh, about his transversal skills. In the Australian national curriculum, it's general capabilities. In the New Zealand national curriculum, it's key competencies. In the Singaporean national curriculum, they're called the desired outcomes of education. Uh, and you will find many countries that use different language, 21st century skills, key skills, soft skills, non-cognitive skills, what have you. It's all this kind of thing, and they tend to be in three groups. And what I want to, for the, for the rest of this presentation, I want to try and get more specific, more precise, because I think Martin yesterday mapped the territory. I don't need to do that again. He made the case uh, as I have been making very quickly, as to why we can't neglect this aspect of what's going on in our schools, but we now need to get more precise, more forensic about what those desired outcomes are. I should have said at the beginning, by the way, that I, I think uh, some maybe Margot said earlier, these pres this presentation, like the others, will be available on the conference website, so please don't feel you have to scribble everything down. I should have said that about half an hour ago, shouldn't I? So the first cluster, and the ones that Paul Tuff writes about most uh, importantly, most centrally, the platform, the launch pad for a successful life, are the qualities of what we call self-control. Many of you will be familiar with the marshmallow experiment. Leave a four-year-old on her own in a room with a marshmallow on a plate and say to her, I've got to go out. If I come back in 10 minutes, if the marshmallow is still there, you can have two. But if you've eaten it, that's it. And whether the children eat the marshmallow, whether they can restrain their impulse to eat the marshmallow, is a predictor of where they're going to end up in life. Not 100%, 
but an interesting, a very interesting predictor. So the ability to manage your own impulses, to delay gratification, to, to maintain focus on what it was you wanted to be doing despite distractions, those foundational skills that either start in the family or in the preschool, we need to make sure that they're in place because they are absolutely powerful predictors. There's recent research which shows that there's an interesting moderating effect that, uh, that, that sits on top of the marshmallow effect. They're much more likely to resist the temptation to eat the marshmallow if the adult is known to be trustworthy to the child. In other words, if they can, if they can genuinely believe that delaying it will be worth it, that they'll get the two, mar two marshmallows at the end. If, in an experimental situation, you've turned out to be unreliable in your promising, then the child is much more, very sensibly, is much more likely to eat the one marshmallow on the plate. But nevertheless, the development of that quality is a very important foundation for life. Second set of qualities have always been around, and they vary somewhat from school to school, but they're the virtues the values, the habits of being a good friend and a good neighbor, the moral or the ethical qualities, being kind, being generous, being, forgive, being forgiving, playing nicely, uh, being honest, being trustworthy, being morally courageous. In other words, being willing to do the right thing even though the rest of your friends might not be. Those kinds of qualities have been around for a long time and they're part and parcel of this approach. Some people call it character education, although in some parts of the world that phrase has got muddled up with a more controlled agenda about sex and drugs and things like that, which is not specifically what we're focusing on today. Uh, but the third set are the ones that I've spent the last 30 or 40 years of my life trying to burrow into. And they're the ones that are to do with how you respond when the world goes tricky on you, when things are unexpected or surprising or strange or novel or fast changing, when someone fresh comes along and says, we're going to do it a little bit differently now, or when your favorite way of responding suddenly for a reason that you don't know turns out not to deliver the results that you'd anticipated. I try, I'm going to come back to this point, I try mostly to speak in plain language and I think it's important that we do. But I am a professor and therefore I'm going to allow myself one fancy phrase. I hope it'll be only one. The fancy phrase is the epistemic apprenticeship that we are putting young people through. Less formally, what's the kind of mind training that is going on in classrooms as we teach the history of the early settlers or simultaneous equations or the colors of the rainbow or how to te tie your shoelaces, as we're doing whatever we're doing, we always necessarily do it in a way that is either encouraging self-reliance or not. That is either walking on the leading edge of what young people can do for themselves and encouraging them to expand that, or walking two steps behind that leading edge and therefore denying them the opportunity to push forward in terms of their ability to manage and organize learning for themselves. Those are the ones that I want to go on and explore. And I've said this may be too small to read at the back, but you don't need to read this slide because it repeats some of the things that Martin was talking about yesterday. Basically, there are dozens of countries around the world, like Australia, who, are, who know that this is the difficult but vital addition to what's going on in our schools, that we need to turbocharge the traditional curriculum so that we are systematically producing youngsters who will flourish and not flounder in a world that is complex and fast-changing. So I'm not going to go through these, but you'll see that those concepts, familiar concepts that we were talking about yesterday, recur. And I've picked out some of them in red on this slide. Creative, enterprising, 
competent, confident, connected is a word that's been around here for the last two days, adaptable, resilient, independent, critical, questioning, reflective, good at working in teams, taking risks, being innovative, and even appreciating beauty, and that's the Singaporean curriculum. The interesting thing about Singapore is not that they can reliably produce three-year-olds who can multiply 2.3 by three quarters. The point is that they're dissatisfied with that in Singapore. That they've changed their focus of education. That they now realize that, that teaching in a way that produces highly efficient, highly effective, calculating little robots doesn't equip them for the 21st century. So their declared a curriculum, their national curriculum, is built around what they call the desired outcomes of education, which includes all these qualities. And also I put up some information from a recent change in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, which again uses the same kind of language, flexible, imagining, exploring options, taking risks, discussing, debating, being curious. You're familiar with the language. Now I want to say a little bit about, this is sort of words of advice, if you'll allow me, about productive and unproductive ways forward in the developing discussions in your partnerships about how to do this well. I've been working, as I've said, on this kind of stuff for, well, practically working with people in schools for the last 16 years or so, theoretically um, as a cognitive scientist for a lot longer than that. But we've been doing it, we've been at it long enough uh, to be able to say with some confidence what works well and what doesn't work well. So, uh, as I say, if you'll allow me, perhaps I can make some suggestions about how to, how to go well with this. And the first set of suggestions are to do with language. And that's really important. This is not something optional or peripheral or academic. The way we talk about this territory has a powerful impact on whether we're going to make really fruitful progress or not. And these are the kind of lessons that I, you might want to chew these over this afternoon in your groups. We need to speak, as I hope I do, with passion about this. This is young people's lives and squeezing grades out of them is not doing them the best service we could in order to prepare them for the 21st century. A kind of anemic, dispassionate language doesn't help here because we need to get buy-in from the students and their parents. Whatever age they are, whatever levels of educational aspiration they have, we need them to understand and be enthusiastic, to be moved and touched by this as a possibility. Therefore, we need to speak with a degree of passion. Secondly, we need to speak plainly, not in academic terms about this, for exactly the same reason. So I will disagree with Martin. I will not use phrases like transversal skills. I think that's dreadful language. We might need to use it when we're talking to posh people, to people from boards of education or ministries or whatever, because there may be forums within which that kind of language is necessary. But we may also, but if we do, we have to be bilingual. We have also to talk in language that is concrete, down to earth, accessible and appealing to young people and their parents. So not metacognitive awareness, not self-regulation, not transversal skills but a language that you, will, that you will know well enough and you can maybe sharpen and develop in your own communities, which has grip, which has bite, which has impact, which is language of power in those communities, not a language of bureaucracy or academia. Some people, when I say that, think, I uh, think, uh, have a kind of negative reaction and say this is about dumbing down. No, 
it's not about dumbing down, it's about smart communication. It's about finding ways that engage the very people whose engagement we need if we're going to make progress with these things. Um, and then maybe we might need to develop other kinds of language. We need to be more precise in the way we talk about these things. So vague talk about motivation or engagement or self-esteem or even, I apologize in this present company, even well-being, I think is too broad, too vague a language for many teachers to get a handle on. We need to go down one level of analysis. We need a slightly finer grain of, of language in order to give us and our students, our children, a better understanding of what we're up to and why we're up to it. So I think that's part of the work that now is going on around the world. The consensus about the importance of what I'm talking about is almost there. There are very few people, very few people, unfortunately, ministers of education seem to be overrepresented in this group who don't get it. But most people do. Our minister of education in the UK, the man called Michael Gove, who absolutely doesn't get it. Who, he's a, he got a first from Oxford, but he doesn't seem bright enough to understand that it's possible to get good grades and to develop these personal qualities. He thinks that it's necess necessarily, if you start talking about the process of learning, that must mean that you no longer care about cultural treasures like algebra and Shakespeare. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. It means you're thinking in a broader and more subtle way about how to do both. A friend of mine looked up the word gove in the Oxford English Dictionary a little while ago. It's a rare word which means to stare vacantly into space. It's quite a nice... I was rather reassured when I, when I discovered that. <clears throat> I have no idea if there is a, a rare word that corresponds to your current Federal Minister of Education. But you... Okay, practical. We need, the language needs to be practical. It needs to make suggestions to us and to busy teachers. It needs to be close enough to their practice to make suggestions about how they might do things a little bit differently. The language needs to be progressive, not as, a, as against traditional, but in the sense that it, it contains development. The concepts get richer and deeper. The world is in love with the idea of resilience at the moment, but a lot of places don't have a good idea about how resilience will look different to a 17-year-old than it did to a four-year-old. We need to know that, don't we? We need to have ways of unpacking, unfurling these concepts so that we can keep building them as students go through school. You don't just do three weeks on resilience and that's it. It's quite different for a violinist or a surgeon or a a batsman, and it's different for a four-year-old, or a seven-year-old, or a 15-year-old. We need to get more detailed about these kinds of things so that we know how to grow them, how to build them over the years of school. And this language needs to be created and refreshed through discussion. Don't just buy it off the peg from me or Art Costa or the IB Learner Profile, take it on the mat and wrestle with it and come up with better words, words that have stronger meaning or impact for your communities. Don't be awed by anybody who is trying to sell you a well-produced package of these kinds of things. Take whatever comes your way as a provo provocation and a stimulus for your own thinking and your own development in your partnerships because that way there will be deeper understanding and greater ownership amongst your colleagues and amongst your, uh, your communities that you'll be working with. And that sense of buy-in is really important. This is from a, from a piece of research uh, evaluating some of the building learning power schools. I don't think I've used that phrase yet, although it's in my title. 
and it's the, the phrase that we use to describe this general approach. We did an evaluation uh, study, or we had commissioned an evaluation study a little while ago, and we talked with lots of people in schools. This slide is just an extract from an interview with uh, the chair of the Board of Governors. I don't know what your equivalent would be if you have such a thing in South Australia. A group of people who kind of advise and oversee what's going on in schools. And I like this quote because if you can try and imagine his voice, it rings with precision and passion. It's our job not just to help ch children master literacy and numeracy. Notice the importance of the word just. We haven't taken our eye off that ball we're still doing that. In fact, Bushfield Primary School is doing that very well. But it's results plus, literacy plus, numeracy plus. And here comes the plus. But to prepare them for a very turbulent and complex world. That's how it looks in Milton Keynes in England. Whatever the grades, we're failing if we don't prepare them with the skills they need to cope with uncertainty, to cope with working with different kinds of people, to ask good questions. There are our old friends. Coping with uncertainty, collaboration, good team working, and inquisitiveness and questioning. Our children are at a very crucial age, says Simon. We need to get those skills right into the DNA of the way our children think and learn before it's too late. There's a voice of urgency. There's a clarity and commitment. So I would hope that in, if I come back in six months or nine months or a year's time, everybody in your school community, everybody in your partnership will be able to speak fluently and comfortably and confidently the language of the plus. One of the reasons why this, these initiatives, although people know that they're the right thing to be doing, often fizzle out or flounder, as they ha did in Tasmania, as they have done in New Zealand, as they have done in the UK. The green shoots of the 21st century education, sometimes with a shift of government, tend to be neglected. They tend to dry up and wither. And one of the reasons is because quite a lot of people don't feel fluent and comfortable talking this language. They feel safer staying and clearer, staying on the dry, high ground of NAPLAN and tests and statistics and the traditional, more easily accessible outcomes of schooling. But that's like, uh, you, uh, you probably remember this, uh, this, this old story of the man who was on his hands and knees under a street light at night, looking around, and someone else came along and said to him, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking for my car keys. The other person said, well, where did you lose them? He said, well, I lost them over there, down that dark alleyway. And the man said, well, why aren't you looking down there? He said, I can't see down there. This is where the light is. And the fear is that there are still some people in education who are only looking where the light is, rather than looking for the plus, which is difficult which is tricky, which is not so easily accessible, but which is absolutely vital if we're going to prepare all young people for the 21st century. So developing this kind of talk is, I think, of the, absolutely of the essence. But let's get a little bit more forensic about what these qualities of mind are. Remember, I'm just looking now at the, what was my fancy word, the epistemic qualities. Those which determine when you face something that is tricky, difficult, or frustrating, will you roll your sleeves up? That's why I'm not wearing my jacket, by the way. This is, I mean, this is a, the roll your sleeves up session, I hope, which I'm trying to model here. That you'll, will you roll your sleeves up like one of Carol Dweck's seven-year-olds? Some, most of you in the room, I hope, will know, be familiar with the work of Carol Dweck already. She'd given a series of problems to a seven-year-old which were designed to be too difficult for him to be able to do. And the question was, how does he respond as you keep giving him, offering him new problems after a series of failures? 
and she described in a talk of hers that I was at a little while ago, this seven-year-old who'd failed on five or six problems already, and then, she, then comes the crucial moment where she says, would you like to do another one? And he said, almost literally, he said, come on, Mrs. Dweck, bring it on. I love a challenge. Now, he's probably a pain in the ass, that kid. <laughs> but that's, but it would rather that than the other, wouldn't you? Rather that than, oh, I don't know, oh, I don't do things like that, oh, I think that's boring. No. People who shy away from things that are too difficult because they've already developed an addiction to looking good. That's the Carol Dweck work, isn't it? If you've been misled by those who care for you into thinking that your self-worth is dependent upon a constant stream of successful performances, your tower stays up, your sums are correct, you're able to play your little tune on the piano when the auntie and uncle come round. If you've been trained to be a little performer in that kind of way, your learning will have been damaged. Your willingness to try new things, to be more adventurous, to not mind making mistakes, to stick with things when they're difficult, will have been undermined. You will have been trained out of your learning. And learning is the most precious resource. Our job is to produce young people who can function well in situations for which they have not been specifically prepared. Seymour Papert, co-founder of one of the most successful scientific laboratories on the planet, the MIT Robotics Lab, that quote that I showed you earlier. We have to keep reminding ourselves that this is at the heart of what we're trying to grow. Asking good questions, being exploratory, having a go at new things, being willing to be adventurous, having courage. I put this, these, turned these into seven Cs. Sometimes they're four Rs. I tend to keep changing the framework, if you like. Courage is the resilience uh, cluster. But I'm fed up with resilience. People have sort of latched on. Don't we, we sometimes latch on to words in education, don't we? And then they kind of get formulaic and a bit stale. We latched on to student voice in my country, and it became a bit of a fetish. Student, do we do student voice? Have we done enough student voice? Yes, we do student voice. As if it were just, you know, something, a special little something that we add on, rather than... They discovered this in, in businesses, didn't they, about 30 years ago. It's called customer services. It's called talking to your customers because they might have interesting things to say which will enable you to improve your product. That's what student voice is. It's not some kind of you know, little set pieces. It's building, as Wendy was talking about, a relationship with your students so that they come to see themselves as people who have a valued contribution to make to the way you do teaching and learning in your schools. In my school, my, when I was at school, they never thought about that, right? They did it all, my teachers did it all. But now, according to John Hattie, we will help our students get better results and be better prepared for the world if we are constantly finding ways progressively to involve our students, whether they're three years old or 17 years old, I don't mind, to involve them progressively in being more thoughtful about designing the learning activities for themselves. They become co-creators. Whoops, that was another fancy phrase, wasn't it? I thought I'd said I was going to. They become co-creators of their own educational experience, and they become progressively more sophisticated, more competent, more responsible about doing that because we're coaching them too because we see that that's the plus, that's the extra bit that we're trying to add on. Developing craftsmanship, loving looking at what you've done and thinking about how to improve it. You've discovered, I don't know if you've ever, there's a British comedian called Ricky Gervais. Has he come to South Australia? Any of you ever see The Office, the British version of The Office? 
Well, if you have, you'll know that he's not a sentimental character. He's quite hard-boiled. But he did an interview in a British paper a little while ago where he was talking about what he was like at school. He was a, bit of, he was a clever dick. That won't surprise you. It was, his job was to kind of do enough to get the good enough grades whilst mucking about enough not to lose street cred. Right? That was, a lot of students do that, don't they? They're, kind of, they're balancing those different kinds of things. And he said he regretted that now. And he used an interesting phrase. He said, it wasn't until I was working on the scripts for The Office with Stephen Merchant, his partner, arguing, refining, ripping up, storming out, coming back together again, having another go. He said, it wasn't until I was going through that process that I discovered the joy of the struggle. And I think one of our responsibilities is to make damn sure that every child who goes through our preschool center or our primary school or our secondary school keeps discovering and rediscovering the joy of the struggle, especially the bright ones, shouldn't we? Because it's the students who coast through, who for some reason or another don't make many mistakes and who find most of school learning easy who are the least prepared for difficulty when it finally rears up and bites them. They have to discover the joy of the struggle just as much as the low achieving students. That's craftsmanship. Self-evaluating, not, not minding when people give you feedback because that's how you learn, isn't it? Other people are really great to have around. You could say, what do you think of this? Or would you mind having a look at these first couple of chapters for me? Or I'm a bit stuck on the bird box that I'm making. I'd really welcome your views. But some children in school don't like feedback because they interpret it as a personal criticism, don't they? Some adults do, actually, yeah? So our job is to help them move from the personal criticism point of view to the robust, welcoming point of view. I was in a, a school the other day. Something that's whizzed around the UK is called, it's a part of assessment for learning. It's called two stars and a wish. Does this come your way? You heard of two stars and a wish? It means getting children to give each other feedback. And the way you do it is you have to tell them two nice things before you hit them with the criticism, right? And a friend of mine who teaches in a primary school was having a little conversation. They'd been doing the two stars and a wish thing in his classroom. And then he had a conversation with the children about exactly what I've just been talking about. Why do we need the two stars, he said to them. And they had an interesting, they were about eight years old, seven or eight. They had an interesting conversation. And they said there were a number of reasons why the stars might be useful, but one of the reasons is precisely because when, you, when someone gives you the wish, like the, you know, and it might have been even better if, right, you can experience that as hurtful. So if you had the two stars, I really loved the way you did this, and I thought that bit was brilliant. If you have those first, it kind of plumps you up so that you can cope with the, with the criticism when it comes, right? And the children understood that, and they thought that was his. So what they did in this classroom, which is a very BLP-ish thing to do, building learning power, BLP, was they said, well, we'll start, we'll carry on with two stars and a wish for the next week, and then we'll see if we can go to one star and a wish, because we'll be getting tougher little learners. We won't be hurt by criticism. We'll be learning not to interpret it that way, but to take it as something valuable and important. And then after another couple of weeks, they decided, all right, we're ready for it. Bugger the stars, we'll go straight to the wish. Because they had become, they'd been helped by their teacher to understand that this was something useful for life. Yeah? To shift their attitude. And you can do it with any group of learners. In a month, you can create that shift. If you have the language to talk to them about it, and if you see yourself as a mind coach. If you see that that's a big part of what you're up to in your classrooms. I'm not just teaching chemistry, I'm teaching careful observation as well. I'm not just teaching history, I'm teaching putting yourself in other people's shoes as well. I'm not just teaching maths, 
I'm teaching learning to enjoy the process of diagnosing your own errors as well. And so on, and so on, and so on. In now thousands of classrooms, not just with my system, but as I say, with Harvard Visible Thinking, with Art Costa's Habits of Mind, with lots of different approaches now, lots of youngsters are developing what we would call in my system more powerful learning muscles. They're developing these habits of mind, to use Art Costa's phrase, which they know are going to stand them in good stead when they get to university, when they go to their TAFE their, to do their apprenticeship, when they become parents, when they're made redundant. They know that. They know that that's one of the main reasons why they're at school. I won't go through all of these, but uh, you get the idea. De developing the capacity for creativity, creative mindedness. This is the work that I was doing with, with Cleese a little while ago. Developing the abilities to be a good collaborator. That doesn't just mean doing group work. It means designing your classroom so that the your children are becoming progressively better at knowing when to work on their own and when to work with other people, when they need a teacher and when they want to be left alone. At thinking about what would be the right way of configuring learning for themselves. There was a classroom I was in the other day, five, six-year-olds. Tiny little thing, right? This is all I'm talking about. I'm talking about little things that carry a different spirit, that carry the plus in the classroom. So the teacher said to the children, she explained to them an activity that she wanted them to do. And then she said, as if it was the most natural thing in the world, which it was in this classroom, because it was a BLP school, she said, before you do the activity, I want you just to spend one minute with your learning buddy. What would be the best group size to do that activity in, do you think? Go on, off you go. So the children very quickly started chatting away, one minute, hands go up. They had ideas. They thought twos would be good because they needed to be really focused. Another group thought fours might be good because they'd benefit from a range of different opinions and experiences. The majority of them thought trios would be good. Okay, let's try threes, off you go. All right? Now that took maybe two or three minutes out of a lesson. It's a little training activity in involving the students in a small, manageable way in learning to think like teachers. Learning to engage with what's going on in the classroom that is going progressively to build that John Hattie capacity. Large, large effects on achievement occur when students become their own teachers. That little wrinkle, that little tweak in that lesson is a small step on that journey, isn't it? And we could make other steps. There are lots of other things. Imagine building up over different subjects and over the years, all those different little tweaks and little wrinkles so that by the time they're five or 10 or 15 or 20, they know when to work on their own, how to repair a group that isn't functioning very well, who to call on when they're stuck with something or other, and so on. They have a sophistication about their ability to engage in the social side of learning, which many university undergraduates that, I'm, that I know don't have. Many adults I know don't have. But these five or eight or ten-year-old children do because they've been helped to by their teachers. And I don't care what their social background, because I've seen it in very impoverished communities. I've seen it in wealthy communities. Any groups of children who are helped, and th it includes those with special needs, in special education, with disabilities, any group of children can be helped to develop these kinds of mental habits and these kinds of mindsets. Very importantly, I put down the bottom copying, because like many other people in the room, I was powerfully reminded by Uncle Lewis's introduction to this conference yesterday about the, the crucial importance, not just in indigenous cultures, but in all our lives, of developing acute, sustained 
willingness to look at what other people are doing and imbibe their expertise through our eyes and through our ears. That never goes away. We never outgrow that. It's what Jean Piaget called sensory motor intelligence. But he was wrong, if he ever did say this, and I don't think he did, to say that's just childish and they grow out of it into concrete operations or formal operations. No, you never grow out of your sensory motor intelligence and it can get more and more sophisticated, more and more precise as you grow up, or it can get weaker. Uh, an American researcher called Barbara Rogoff did a wonderful experiment a, a little while ago looking at children in different cultures. Particularly, she was looking at a group of children in Mayan cultures in Mexico, as opposed to middle class, roughly, children in an American city. And the study just took two young children, three, four-year-olds, a pair of them at a time. And an adult said to them, um, I've got a really good trick you can do with paper. Would you like to learn it? And it was designed so they would say yes. And then she, the adult, said, OK, but I can only teach you one at a time. So Anna, would you come over, over here? And Ben, would you, you sit over there. There's another toy you can play with. And we'll get to you in a minute. And then what she did was videotaped the observing child in these two different communities. In the much, at a conference I was at, she played a 90-second clip of Ben, what he was doing whilst the teacher, let's call her that, was working with Anna to show her the trick. In the Mayan culture, it looked like a still photograph, this 90 seconds. Ben was absolutely locked on to what was going on between the teacher and Anna. He was soaking up vicariously the learning that was happening. In the American culture, within seconds, the observing child was, I don't want a stupid toy, I don't want to play with that. When's it my turn? It's not fair. Friends have told me I do that alarmingly well. That Maybe I was an American child in, a, in, a, in, a, in an earlier life. A week later, when those two children are followed up, the Mayan child is able to perform the trick himself with very little help and is able to figure out the bits that he hasn't already observed. In other words, he's learned heaps. The American child is now, you didn't teach me. You didn't tell me. You didn't expect me to do it. I can't do it. So we can educate children out of their valuable learning muscles, can't we? Yeah? By making them, well, whatever. There are ways in which we could weaken their ability to be good learners. So we should have all our children in our schools saying this. Our teachers are, this is their language, our teachers are helping us get used to, we're building the habits, not just learning skills, we're building habits of asking interesting questions, of checking what we're told, learning to think on our feet, design our own learning for ourselves, choose good learning projects, make good use of resources, help ourselves when we're stuck. Don't just go helpless and floppy and wait for the teacher to rescue you. Using our own imaginations and so on. And there are uh, many other things that we could explore in that slide. You'll have these slides, so they might be useful to you as you design your thinking. L last footnote on language. There are some slippery phrases that I would advise you to avoid. One of them is improving learning. I've heard it used quite a lot in the last couple of days, or teaching for effective learning. The trouble with those phrases is that they are deeply ambiguous. Does improving learning simply mean improving the results? In many schools, it does. When I ask a group of teachers, how would you know if you had improved the quality of your children's learning? They would say, well, their reading is better. Or they're getting better grades on their maths. But you could be helping them get better grades on their maths by over-helping them, by spoon-feeding them. You could help children get better results 
in a way that doesn't build their capacity to manage and organize learning for themselves. I'm sorry, Margot, I've argued with Margot, Margot about teaching for effective learning, which she won't, she likes it, she won't change it. But I just say be wary, be really vigilant about what you mean underneath those phrases. Because improving learning can all too easily slide you back into a concern with the traditional curriculum to the neglect of the vital, the crucial plus, which we're trying to keep our minds on. In the Australian curriculum, the key phrase, one of the key phrases is successful learners. And that could mean two very different things. It could mean students who get high grades, or it could mean powerful, confident, independent, real life learners. And they're not the same, which is why we always use the phrase learning power, improving students' learning power, building their learning power, expanding their capacity to learn. Because if you don't use a slightly more precise phrase, there's a risk that you'll get sucked back into the traditional concerns and you'll think you're doing something more than you were. So we can teach all these things. We can construct activities so that my seven C's or whatever other framework you like to work with, could be habits of mind or any others, are being systematically grown and stretched in the classroom. We can teach curiosity. This is a quotation from our research project of a boy, a 15-year-old boy, in a high-achieving boys' grammar school in the home counties in England, in Buckinghamshire. He'd recently arrived in this new school, and he was interviewed for this project. He said, in my old school, they just gave you harder and harder worksheets. In other words, that was the limit of, the, of his previous school's understanding of what progression meant in the school. It's just the same old worksheets, same old learning process, just the content got harder and harder. And then he says something really interesting. He says, but here they really stretch you to learn in different ways. Isn't that interesting? That's being a successful learner, having lots of different ways of going about learning, not just focusing on the achievement and the performance and the predicted and the target grades, but stretching, broadening, deepening the capacity to learn. And he says, here you get lots of encouragement, so you learn to keep going and dig deep. In three years, that school has transformed itself from a school that was getting high grades, but very instrumental, very dependent, students who never asked any questions except, is this going to be on the exam, sir? To a school where almost to a boy, to a man, they love to dig deep now. So Tom says, now I always like to see if I can take things one step further. He's more like a three-year-old, isn't he now? Yeah? He's had rehabilitated that fearlessness in the face of learning that not being afraid to ask questions or make mistakes. He's got his learning power back, and it's now more sophisticated than it was before. I love this photograph. I went on a visit to Russia a little while ago and went to some of the Vygotsky schools. They're called the Golden Key schools. Some of you might be familiar with those. And this is when, when we were greeted. This young woman is our guide or courier, and she's being greeted by the deputy principal of the school. His title actually isn't deputy principal of the school. His title in that school, this is the Golden Key School in Ushuaia, Belitsa, his job title is Master of Imagination. Isn't that a great job title? And his job is to keep, he's a trained clown. You may think your deputy is a trained clown, I don't know. <laughs> his job is to keep creating small mysteries for the students in the school so that they get used to thinking on their feet. So they will arrive one morning and there will be a crime scene. There'll be a couple of people dressed as policemen, there'll be crime, incident, 
tape around in the playground. There'll be the chalked outline of a dog or a cockerel on the ground and gradually the mystery will unfold and those children are being helped to know how to face uncertainty. How to, this was a phrase that I, a friend of mine used the other day, I really liked it, how to flounder intelligently. That school is putting energy into preparing them for the 21st century. And there are many other schools that are doing things similar. These are just examples, I'll have to speed through these. These are examples of just how to, how to build questioning in your school. The top image is of a high school student who's pinning up on the board at the front of her classroom the list of questions that her small group has generated which are designed to focus on areas of difficulty or misunderstanding in their revising organic chemistry. It's a specific task that every group has to pin up on the board the questions that they've surfaced in discussion. This was a group of students who had effectively become, as far as their teacher could tell, elective mutes in the classroom. They never asked anything except, you know what the question is. But now he's turned that round. He's changed his teaching in a little bit of way, which has brought back their willingness to share doubts, share difficulties, ask questions, and to rehabilitate their courage to dig deep in their understanding of what they're doing. In a preschool or a primary school, you could have the wonder wall, which is just a big display. You can see the children enthusiastically putting up their questions. If they're very small, they can be helped to formulate their questions rather than writing them themselves. That room is a visible celebration of the children's inquisitiveness. This isn't just a room that they walk into to be given answers to somebody else's questions. This is a room that fizzes with their own curiosity, visibly. And the Wonder Wall provides a rich source of stimuli and challenges within that classroom. Interestingly, one of the things that teachers have to learn if they're going to just do something very simple and obvious like the Wonder Wall is they have to give up the idea that whenever anybody asks them a question, they have to answer it. Right? The point of these questions is not to give them answers. The point is to invite and welcome and celebrate the children's inquisitiveness. Now, lots of your schools will have those kinds of things, but some of them don't. Some schools are missing a trick. If they say, we want young people in the 21st century to love questioning, to be inquisitive. We want to cultivate and strengthen their curiosity. There are all kinds of small ways in which we might do that. And once we begin to think like this, we become more, uh, it just becomes more obvious about the different kinds of things we could do. We can teach courage. We can teach resilience. We can teach children's ability to manage risk for themselves. This is one of the, one of the tools that uh, some of your schools, because I've done workshops here before, may already have the riskometer in your classroom. The riskometer is a little indicator that the children can use to just show, to think about how difficult they're going to make a task for themselves. In the old classroom, the teacher dished out a worksheet, or there was a textbook, where the maths problems were all of the same kind and they gradually got harder. We're going to do multiplication today. Turn to page 23 in your book. And it's multiplying two numbers together and they start and they gradually get harder and everybody has to work their way through them. But not in this classroom. In this classroom, the children work in pairs and they can choose the numbers that they're going to try and multiply together. It's not a free-for-all, it's involving them in being able to make some decisions about how much they're going to stretch themselves. And you can see, I don't know if you can read the, uh, you probably can't from where you are, the children have been making comments and sticking them on the riskometer. One of them's written, I took a step to try something just a bit harder than before, I worked on it until I could do it. 
She chose that. She's pushing herself because she wants to. And someone else had written, I don't know if I can read this off the slide, this was a few steps too far for me. Next time, I will choose a more manageable task. They're learning to get better at customizing the learning that's going on in the classroom for themselves. Well, anybody could do that, couldn't they? It's not expensive. There's not a big risk. The downside risk is minimal. The results are not going to plummet. Parents are not going to march on your school or your early childhood center saying, how dare you use my child as a guinea pig for this newfangled way of... No, they're little things, but they carry a spirit. They carry the plus. I hope I'm managing to convey that to you. Particularly with little children, one of the most important things, obviously, and all those of you who work in preschool will know this, is to curb your own tendency to rescue children prematurely. No? They need to learn to expand their ability to walk on the edge of difficulty. If we constantly rescue them from that difficulty, the message to them is difficulty is something that you need to be rescued from. Right? That undermines the development of your resilience. All of these things are obvious, aren't they? once you point them out, once you begin to articulate them. And then it's pretty obvious, so I could change my habits a little bit. I could try not rescuing, I, or I could always say to a child in my preschool, who I think might be kind of struggling a little bit, do you want any help? What kind of help would you like? And most people who work in early years settings will do this because they're very familiar with this character building aspect of learning, but somewhere along the line, sometimes it gets lost, doesn't it? So by the time the children are getting into upper primary or into secondary schools, that concern with walking on the leading edge of their ability to manage difficulty for themselves, we've lost that sensibility. And all we're trying to do to make a more powerful 21st century education is to keep remembering that. It doesn't just live in early childhood, does it? It lives across the whole piece. Different signs you can put up around the school. This is one from a little primary school in Suffolk in England. Getting stuck is not a problem. Staying stuck is. Practice getting unstuck. Something you can get better at. You don't need to be rescued or helped by a teacher. You can get better at unsticking yourself. Look out active learners inside. My favorite a slide that they, a image that they produced wasn't there the day I went in with my camera, or my smartphone. It said, uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly what it said, but something like a sort of take care, lunatics at work. Because they love the idea. Lunatics are people who are mad about learning, right? Yeah? So they'd love a lunatic is someone who's really, really up for a challenge, going to give it a go, give it their best shot, stick with things when they're difficult laugh when they make a mistake and have another go. They're powerful, staunch little learners. This is in a, a preschool where they've made little suggestions about what you could do when you're getting uh, unstuck. Maybe it, it's a primary school, perhaps, where they've all made little, little Wellington boots, little gum boots, which is what put, so that it will help you get out of the mud when you're stuck. It's just lots of schools use different kinds of imagery for these sorts of things. This is a slightly more sophisticated stuck poster. The children generate lots of ideas that they can put on a classroom wall about things that you could do when you're stuck. And across a whole school, you can unfold, I was talking about progression a little earlier, you can unfold these kinds of things. So let's, you could start with a simple set of ideas, maybe in year one or year two, and then gradually you could make it more sophisticated. You could adapt it and add different elements to it. So by the time they get up to year four or year five, they have a more developed, more differentiated, more flexible set of ways of helping themselves when they get stuck. This is not high tech. Anybody could be interested in this kind of thing. We can teach creativity. Let kids get bored is a very good start for that. 
Parents who constantly give in to their children's demands to be entertained are depriving them of opportunities to learn how to use their imaginations to entertain themselves. This is obvious, isn't it, when we think about it? But sometimes it involves frustrating children if they've already be become a bit addicted to being constantly entertained and taken on trips during the school holidays. We need, need to remember these, these kinds of shifts. So there's a range of different possibilities that we could introduce into schools or indeed into families about how we might develop these sorts of things. In one little primary school, they created, they stopped having a home corner and they created a little creativity corner. It was a black sheet draped over some poles. This was a year two classroom. When I was in there a little while ago, I asked a six-year-old, what, what's the creativity corner for? She said, well, it's when we're about to do something creative, like we're gonna do some writing or paint a picture or make a hat or something like that. It's where the creativity corner is where you can go and just go crawl in and be quiet for a bit so that you can let your brain cool down so that it will bubble up with new things. Isn't that a nice idea? Right? It's actually quite a sophisticated description of the process of creativity. These children are learning to understand and manage different brain states that are good for different kinds of things, right? They're becoming sophisticated in the way they use their own minds. They're being helped to do that. Some schools introduce a little practice which is like a slightly more grown-up version of the creativity corner. Practices called stilling or mindfulness. There are a number of different ways in which this gets talked about, which are just learning the same trick, learning how to let your brain move out of that busy, purposeful, focused mode into something more dreamy where things can bubble up. And any child can learn this. There's a group of four children here. I'm not sure if you can see very clearly, but one of them, the second from the right, is clearly hasn't quite got the knack yet. He's trying a bit too hard to relax. Uh, but he'll get it. He'll, he'll, he'll get there in the end. All of these things are perfectly learnable. You can teach craftsmanship, that love of which little children have anyway, that love of kind of coming back to what you've done, tinkering with it, modifying it, thinking about how to improve it, you just have to provide them with opportunities. Craftsmanship takes time. It takes reflection. It takes leaving it and going for a walk and coming back and having another look at it and thinking to yourself, hmm, not sure if I'm happy with that bit. Perhaps I could, or perhaps it means asking your friend to come round and have a look at it with you. So there are all kinds of ways in which we could, if we wanted, make our schools and our classrooms more friendly to the idea of craftsmanship. Displaying students' work in progress is very useful. It makes the idea of making, the, the fact, the idea that making anything worthwhile is a slow process that involves drafting and reconsidering and tinking, tinkering and changing what you're doing. It makes that normal and explicit in the classroom. I've been in schools where rough work is treated like something shameful. Where it's like, you know, if, I, if you were bright, you wouldn't need to do rough work. Well, excuse me, look at Einstein's rough work. Look at Mozart's rough work. Look at Banjo Patterson's rough work. Look at any, the, the, the work behind any worthwhile product. Look at the rough work behind Ricky Gervais's scripts for The Office. It's interesting. And if you're not interested, if you're not tolerant of your rough work, you're a, more, you're a weaker learner, aren't you, if you don't have that tolerance. One of our secondary schools has got the students to mount an exhibition, an art exhibition. They were doing an enrichment course in curating. This is my wife's job. They were learning to be little curators. And their first exhibition, this is the T-shirt. You probably can't read what it says on this T-shirt down the bottom. The exhibition was called, I Never Finish Anything. And that's the T-shirt. And it was a display of unfinished pieces of, work, pieces of work, which invited the audience into a thoughtful conversation about where might this go, or how might it be developed, or it, 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 it involved you 
in a thoughtful conversation about the process of creation. That's interesting, isn't it? Rather than just we only put up the good stuff, the finished stuff, the glossy stuff. Eng English primary school teachers have a way of signaling excellence, by the way, in their primary schools. I don't know if you do the same thing in South Australia. It's called lamination. <laughs> do you laminate a lot? Yeah. So one, once it's laminated, that's kind of the seal of approval, isn't it? It's finished. You can't do anything more with it once it's laminated. But it's the unlaminated that is really interesting. The unlaminated stays full of potential, full of possibility. Always something that you could improve on. Teaching critique. This was, I was doing some work in the 250 teachers in the Riverina uh, last year. And uh, some of the teachers there were from Sydney. And I was sent a little while ago this piece of reflective writing by Debbie No. She's 14. She's from Bankstown Girls' School out in the western suburbs of Sydney, so you'll know it's not a swanky area. She hasn't been in Australia for very long, but she has been coached to produce writing of this quality. It's extraordinary, this piece of reflective writing by an ordinary 14-year-old in Bankstown. Today's lesson was, to be honest, quite tough. It taught me to ask a lot more questions that I usually wouldn't even think about. I don't think I showed much sign of persevering, though. I wasn't a strong contributor to my group today. But I thought one of my strengths was being able to listen. And then she says, this is the bit that makes the hairs stand up on the back of my neck. I don't think I asked the right questions to intensify my learning. That's pretty good, isn't it? If I was able to question myself or others more, I think I would have gained a much better understanding of the topic. And then, out of that reflection comes her targets for the next lesson. What she thinks she needs to work on to become an even more powerful learner. So what I need to improve on for the next lesson is talking about the roles and responsibilities in the group. If I took more responsibility for initiating that conversation, I would be clearer about what my role in this group was, and that would engage me better. Any student could do that. It's taken them perhaps a year to coach and model and discuss to the point where Debbie and every other student in her, in her classroom, all the other girls in that group, can produce reflections of this degree of sophistication. So it's not hard. And we can teach collaboration. I've already talked about helping the children think about how to manage the different group sizes how to repair a group when you feel it's not working very well. Uh, and I don't have time to talk about doing ICT because I'm running out of space. Let me come back to John Hattie because this is the last uh, key of the things that ties this back with the theme of these two days about um, participation and partnerships. I glossed over the middle part of this quote when I showed it to you earlier. There are two factors, according to John Hattie in his first book, that have large effects on students' levels of achievement. One is when we help them learn to think and act like their own teachers, learn to manage and organize and plan learning for themselves. But the reciprocal of that, almost like the mirror image of that, is the bit that I've highlighted in the middle here. The second factor is, when teachers become learners about their own teaching. Because it's contagious. The more youngsters are around us and our staffs who are busy thinking and arguing and talking and discussing and trying new things and sharing ideas with the students. I've never taught it this way before and I'm, I don't, it's gonna be a first for me, but I, I, you know, let me know how it goes down. I, 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 your feedback would be useful. Just as Central Office has been orchestrating this conference for the last two days with a genuine, genuine desire for feedback from the leaders, the site leaders around the region, so any teacher could do that in a classroom, couldn't they? Could be inviting feedback which would enable them to trim and improve their own practice. 
the more children are around people who are functioning like that, the better. And one of the real stimuli, according to the research, for that is when schools get together when there are people going into each other's schools. So I would strongly advise you to treat this opportunity for the partnerships as a learning opportunity. It's so easy, once you've been in a school for two or three years, to succumb to the illusion that the way we do it is the way it has to be done, isn't it? And just having people, other experienced professionals, moving in and out of your schools and saying, oh, that's really interesting, we don't do it like that. Uh, we've done it, oh, we do, yeah, mm, amazing. In New Zealand, it's, it's absolutely normal, and probably there's some Kiwis in the room, for quite young children to be the lollipop people at the, at the, at the crossings. But I was traveling around with someone from in Melbourne last week and they said, oh, that would be far too risky for us to do that. We need, it's much better to have older people, to have seniors doing that because it gives them a role in the community. Quite different. You, you move into a different culture and suddenly what you've taken as being necessary or normal becomes something you can think about and something you can question and something that you might want to revise. So below the surface of these partnerships is a really powerful invitation for learning. And uh, I've run out of time a bit, but that's all right. You can have the slides. Final message. It isn't that we don't know what to do to embed more powerfully the results plus philosophy. The question is, do we do what we know? And that's the tricky bit. It's embedding these things into our practice, isn't it? There's lots of knowledge out there. Books by David Perkins and Art Costa and John Hattie and me and lots of other people teeming with practical ideas. That's not the problem. The problem is, uh, do we allow our imaginations to be fired and do we go back into the classroom and try something a little bit different and see how it goes down, to see what the effect is? That's John Hattie's visible learning. Try something a little bit different and see what the effect is. Because if we do that, then we're on the journey. Then we're really in the business of trying to develop these powerful little learners, which nobody argues against uh, as being a core purpose for 21st century education. I'll leave you with this famous overused quote from, from Goethe. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it tomorrow or whenever in your classroom, something a little bit different, talk to your colleagues, put it into your partnership conversations. Boldness has genius, power and magic in it. It's a great quote, isn't it? Genius, power and magic. But you have to do something, not just sit around and talk about it. You have to try something a bit different. Begin it now. Thank you very much.